Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if we can take our seats, we'll get started. Welcome back to our second session of the day here at Automotive Logistics Supply Chain Conference 2017. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Christopher Ludwig. I'm the editor of the Automotive Logistics Group, uh, including Automotive Logistics Magazine, which hopefully by now you all know. If you don't, it's in your delegate packs. Uh, please, do, please do be sure to check that out. We have quite a, a busy session here today with quite a lot of presentations and also something special at the end uh, with a uh, venture who's doing a, a prize draw using a drone, and there'll be some prizes. So just a, as a quick note, if anyone hasn't yet given their business card or put their business card in the, in the bowl, so to say, to win, it's currently on the back table uh, where the, can someone just, uh, Harry, can you just lift that up right there? Yeah. So it's right there in the back. If you, during the session at some point, if you want to just drop your business card and if you haven't done that already, we'll do a draw at the end. Okay, back to this uh, session for content. The name of this session, we've called it Brain Over Brawn, Why Smarter Thinking Will Dominate Tomorrow's Supply Chain. And you might be thinking brain over brawn. Brain, that sounds almost anachronistic in the context of digitalization and technology. Maybe it should be robots and AGVs over muscle and plants and warehouses and algorithms and software over our inefficient and error-prone brains, or at least my error-prone brain. But uh, at Automotive Logistics, you know, we're still giving uh, the most credit to, to the human brain as well as to the, the skills and adaptability of workers and managers that are essential to uh, supply chain and logistics development uh, especially in, in the age of digitalization, electrification, and autonomy, uh, all those topics which we heard about in first session and which we're going to talk about a bit more uh, here with our, our panel of experts today. For connected technology to provide the gains we envision, there must also be close human and organizational connections across company management silos, suppliers, uh, new adaptation of processes, as well as constant training and education. So brain over brawn, yes, but brain together with software skills and collaboration. And I think that's some of the examples we're going we're gonna to see from, uh, from our panel today in terms of the smart thinking and the new ways of working uh, that might accompany the introduction of new connected technologies and the, the strategies that, that companies are setting out uh, as they transition more into the digitalization. Uh, you'll see some, some good opportunities of the opportunities ahead, and, and also we'll definitely be addressing some of the difficulties and the challenges that come with, with shaping uh, new, new processes and technology across this very complex industry. We'll also get some views from outside the automotive industry as well. So um, let me introduce the panel before I start handing over. Um, we're going to hear first from James Rusty Coleman, who's the Director of Digital Industrial Operations for Electrolux in, in North America. Electrolux, of course, is a, uh, not necessarily in, in the industry, automotive industry, but going to give us a good uh, you know, perspective on what's happening in the appliance side and other, other industries that are also uh, seeing this revolution. Uh, Mel Kirk is the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer at Ryder. So he also had a little bit of an introduction already this morning from his colleague. Maybe it's the second best job at Ryder, right? So uh, we'll hear a bit more from, from, from that perspective. Um, we'll then also have a, 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 a joint presentation, so example of a kind of collaboration, I think, that, that we're seeing as companies uh, move towards more, more digital processes and technology. Um, Michael Meyer is the president of Venture Global Solutions, and he'll be presenting together with Daryl Bowe, who's a section manager for material management and logistics at Subaru of Indiana Automotive. So it's quite an interesting project and transition that, that, that the Subaru has been going through together with Venture, and we'll, we'll get to hear a lot from that. Uh, last but certainly not least is Shankar uh, Yaya Raman, who's, the, uh, who's from BXB Digital, which is a, a division of Brambles, uh, I'm a part of, our, uh, of CHEP, so, uh, and I think is also uh, more close to the Silicon Valley side of things as well. So we'll, we're, we're moving across the the supply chain across industries, and uh, I still hope we'll still have some time for, for Q&A at the end. But before, let's uh, not delay any further. Rusty, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Brains and brawn, I'm reminded of Baloo the Bear. I'm loaded with both. <laughs> so if you've not seen the movie, you need to watch it. So what is an appliance guy doing at an automotive conference? 
uh, talk about digital. Uh, we're all in the same space. We're all chasing basically the same rabbit. This gives you an idea of what Electrolux is. I work in major appliances, stoves, refrigerators, washers, dryers, dishwashers, that type thing. We have small appliances and also professional, but pretty large company. We're a Swedish-owned company, and from a transportation standpoint and logistics, we move a lot of stuff in a day. Uh, you can only imagine. So we set out a good while back to really try to figure out what are the trends in the industry, what is affecting us. I highlighted two of these. One is the consumer shift, uh, and it is huge. Uh, we used to go into a store, we would have a salesperson, they would talk to us, and they would lead us toward an appliance, and we would buy it. Now you have power in your hand. Uh, you've done research, uh, you've had somebody else's analytics looking and making some decisions for you, and then pushing that decision to you, and you've walked in and you've bought based on a different set of a criteria. So we've seen that. Also, we've seen from a consumer experience standpoint, Years ago, you can remember a lot of the websites used to have a lot of interaction, clicking buttons, doing all this stuff, and if you notice today, it's a lot cleaner, smoother. Uh, we tied together 134 databases, which got us down to one click for a consumer experience. So we're really trying to focus in on what the consumer's really looking for, simplicity, straight to the point, this is what I need to see, this is what I need to know in a very simple, in a simple way. And then the digital transformation. Uh, we understand digital commerce. Uh, probably not as well as we need to, but we understand it well. We see that there's a big change going on with consumers. Uh, I'm a big fan of PayPal. Every time I get on something, I hope they have PayPal because I want a simple interaction. So we see digital commerce coming. Uh, the connected home. We've talked about connected vehicles. I talk about connected home because now People want to have their devices connected, whether it's security or entertainment. Uh, people want, uh, ha want to have a connected home. And then the consumer journey. Uh, it's very important to understand not just what consumers are doing when they interact with you and your website and the things and questions they're asking, but it's also important to understand from a digital DNA standpoint what that consumer finally decided. Where else did that consumer go look and what else? help make that consumer make their decision. So it's all about tying these pieces together. For us, we broke it down into five digital priorities or digital pillars, uh, and I like to call them priorities over pillars, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. It all evolves around the 360 consumer experience, uh, the person that's actually buying the product, uh, the person that's gonna take money and give it to your company. So we wanna focus everything that we do from a digital standpoint on that consumer. And it's, when we think about marketing and branding and sales and service and all that, all that falls right into that one uh, priority that we have. Number two is a connected experience or a connected appliance. Do people really want to talk to their dishwasher? Yes, <laughs> they really do, believe it or not. Uh, some of these things are intuitive, some are not so intuitive. If you cut on your stove and heat starts coming up from the stove, your vent would automatically cut on. It would sense the heat and cut your vent on so you didn't have to forget about it. So a lot of different avenues when it gets to connected appliances. Modularization, digital manufacturing. Now we're getting into space of our PLM, our product lifecycle management. We think about design and how do we get to a modular design and then how do we take that modular design and roll it right in from electronic bills and materials into manufacturing bills and materials. How many touches does it need to have? Hopefully zero. So we look at that, we look at the 3D space uh, in terms of setting up our factories on 3D, setting up our assembly lines on 3D, running 2D simulation models, all that fits in that space of modularization. And then you get down to my world, uh, digital productivity, that's when we're really getting into factory. You know, from one end of the factory to the next, how do we connect that factory? Uh, how do we see what's going on in the factory from the machine tools, the PLCs, our ERP systems, our MES systems, all of the things it takes to actually run a factory. And then, of course, another uh, space I play in is digital supply chain. So, end to end connectivity, transparency, uh, visibility. How do we tie all this together? How do we get our systems talking and how do we use that uh, information? So, we understand that we really cover 360 degrees of our business with this simple five points right here. But what are we really trying to achieve? At the end of the day, 
the customer experience, the consumer experience, is the most important thing for us. We spend an awful lot of time and money trying to make sure that we give them the best experience possible because in our world and the competitive nature of it, it's a very important space for us to play in. But also we want to have a company, so operational excellence is also how do we take cost out of the business. So how do we get there? You know, how did we, we develop and then how do we continue this vision and go forward with it? Well, we created digital governance. And that digital governance starts at the global level. We're a global company. We have four sectors. I work in North America. So we put in an infrastructure in those five pillars that start at global and roll down to the sectors. So again, I play in the number four and the number five space. And uh, we have selected digital leaders. So if you go into the different sectors and you start talking about the pillars, you have people that are assigned each one of these priorities uh, inside of our sectors. So as we roll out things, we try to, we're a global company, we try to do things globally. So you all know the difficulties in doing that. Our basic tact is if we can keep systems and infrastructure at about 80% and leave 20% to the sector, 20% to an individual factory, then we think we've done a pretty good job in trying to keep it standardized. So we have leaders that try to maintain that for us, and we, again, follow the global to sector footprint so that we roll things down. And then we do work inside of sectors, and as we uh, progress in the sector, we roll that back up to global. Is it worthwhile to roll it out to the other sectors or not? And it, it's really beneficial. And this is a key point, consistency versus competition. One of the reasons I like to say priorities instead of pillars, I say pillars and priorities interchangeably, I, I realize it because I see it so many times as a pillar. The problem with a pillar, when you look at it as a pillar, it looks like a silo. The problem with the silo, of course, is now I own this silo and I want to be great at it. So one of the things that I stress very early on as a digital leader in my space is I really want to understand what you're doing in your space. Not that I'm trying to compete, but I want to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it. Do I really need seven, eight, nine analytic tools? How many analytic tools do we need? If you keep a siloed approach to what you do and how you approach digital, you will find that everybody's working on the same stuff. So we want to try to minimize that and, and keep it consistent with what we're doing. Our digital governance board is ran in North America by our vice president of IT. A really great guy to work with. We're very close. So we have developed a digital map. And the digital map, these are the big monumental things that we're going to do over the next five years. And they're pretty big and pretty lofty. Uh, and our job is really to manage the route. Because when you start thinking about uh, supply chain or you start thinking about manufacturing, no matter marketing, no matter which space you go in, you got so many people to work it and you got so many dollars you can spend on it. So our job is to sit there and look at the whole and decide which way are we going. So that means sometimes my priorities take a back seat, somebody else's priorities take a front seat. But that's about working together. Inspire and learn is just what it sounds like. Uh, why am I here? Well, to speak, but I'm also here to learn. What are you guys doing? So I'm, I'm looking to take away. Our job also as digital leaders is to inspire people with what's coming, what we see out there, and the things that we're going to do and to get people's appetite wet for the digital transformation that's occurring in our factory. And watch for the warning lights. And quite frankly, most of the warning lights always have something to do with money, it seems like. You know, how much money do you have to spend on it? How much money can you spend? What's going on with markets and trends? How's the business, the health of the business? The key thing, digitize to enable effortless experiences. You know, that's what it's all about. Simplify everyday life. We talk about our consumer, which is the person that actually bought the appliance. Our customers would be the big box uh, retailers where we ship stuff to and people go in and buy. And then the employees. Anybody that works in the digital world, you know effortless for everybody else where they're interacting. There's an awful lot of work and there was nothing effortless about it on the back end of it. There's a ton of work to make it easy. So the back end is not easy to play with, and it's not simple either. It's very complex. Uh, so you, ha you have to understand, even though you're trying to make everything forward-facing effortless and everything forward-facing simple, uh, it's a lot of hard work, and it's very complex. It's not easy to get done. 
you evidently run into this eventually, talent. Do you have the people you need to take you from an industry 3.0 world to an industry 4.0 world? Core problem, a lot of us in here have gray hair. We've been doing this for 30 years plus. Uh, we've been moderately successful, but we've done it in an industry 3.0 world. Tools and techniques, thoughts, decisions, data that we use to get us where we got is not what we need for the future. The digital landscape is now different. I often think about today, some of us will go to an old grinding wheel to get some corn uh, to make some good grips. Of course, you can tell I'm a southerner, right? <laughs> but think about years ago when water went off the scene and electricity came on the scene. Who embraced it and who didn't? So what is a novelty today is, is now a mainstream. That's the exact same thing that's going to happen with the connected world. It's going to change us dramatically. And we understand that. The problem, and we had a lot of folks at Hanover here the last week or so, talent. The CEOs at Hanover said the number one problem is talent. That's what we have a problem with. So for us, we've got a very simple approach to it. First is learn. So as we keep learning what the digital landscape means, as we're posting new jobs, we're actually starting to go through those job descriptions and actually start making changes to those job descriptions and start figuring out this is what I need to have over the next three to five years as people I bring into my organization and develop. Uh, the same old job description with the same old industry 3.0 mindset, it's not what I need in the new world. So I've got to start investing in talent. But as we learn it, we make amends to the job description, so new postings go up uh, thinking about this. Also, from those job descriptions, now you can look at the people that's in those jobs today versus what you need in the future. And you're going to start seeing there's probably gaps in there. It has really raised its head inside our organization as we look at things like the MES and, and some of the ERP changes that we're making. We realize that people have been very successful running the factories today are not going to be as successful tomorrow because the skill set they need, they don't have. So our job is to figure that out, get that gap, and then start developing that talent. You know, it's not about how do we get rid of our folks, it's how do we develop it. And also, we're in the buy and rent talent mode. Uh, sometimes it's long term. Uh, we go to consultancies quite often. We bring people in that have a niche that we don't understand or don't know how to use. And sometimes it's just a simple skill set in a project that we need. And we'll go out and buy or rent that as well. So. We could add a list of tools that go down to the floor and up to the ceiling. So how do we practically approach this and kind of how do we take a look at it? You know, there's a lot to be said for standardization. So as a digital leader, I keep my eyes this wide open, looking for all the new stuff, the next new thing that's coming out. But when it gets to something actionable, you really have to start bringing your focus back in. So one of the ways we've looked at this is kind of the shotgun approach all these different things, we've went with different sectors, different factories, and we've said, you take this and play with it, you take this and play with it, you take this and play with it. We want to find out what does that technology do for us. So it's different when we start thinking about how do we establish our infrastructure? What do our servers look like? How are we going to get information in and out of these servers? Is it on-prem? Is it in the cloud? Uh, we're getting pretty rifle focused on that. We don't go with the shotgun approach here. Our network software, hardware, input, output devices as we get that connectivity, sensors that we're putting on a lot of machine tools now to start running predictive analytics on machine tools, and you know, just analytics. We're not trying to find 50 different ways of doing something. We're trying to get the basic core structure established. And then from that, use the old agile methodology. These are the things that we know work for us and let's start moving them from this side into a standard. That's why I say it's sort of, because at the end of the day, you have to get to something that's actionable. And this is a one, one way to do it. So why are we embracing digital? Save money. It, it's, it's, it's the future. It's difficult because when we say, what do you start, where do you start with digital, what's important? This, I can tell you this, I've learned. The most important thing is to create data. Create data like you've never created before. If you don't know what I'm going to do with it, don't worry about it. That comes later. Just create data. And by the way, when you create data, 
store that data. Put it somewhere, because you're going to need it. And then the analytics come when you have all that data, you have it in a place you can capture it. And then you get to the real sexy stuff of, of uh, AI and ML. When I've worked through some major projects, does that mean i got 16 seconds left? No, you can start. Okay, I'm good. Right. The we'll trap go. door opens after five. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got to justifying some major projects, one of the problems with finance basically was, I'm not sure I'm buying into this digital thing because they got the industry 3.0 mindset and this is what it takes to show payback. What is your ROI? Your ROI is too long. It's not, it's not sufficient. I gave them some articles. They started doing some research and some study what AI and ML does for them. One of the key learnings from finance was one of the key things you may not need in the future is accountants. That was a key learning for those guys. So now they understand this is where I'm throwing all my money away, and that's what we're targeting. The point is, the point is from a data perspective, we're only capturing so much data today, which means I'm only storing so much data, which means everybody's talking about analytics, and let's go run analytics. Well, if you're running analytics, on a small subset of data, you're going to get a better outcome, but you're not going to get a Nirvana outcome that you're looking for. So the key thing is for your analytics, the engines that drive it, you've got to have more data. So we look at master data as very small. Transactional data is what most of this is, is history, things that happen inside of our systems, and we have a lot of that. But then you talk about the contextual data, the things that's happening live in real time. It's as big as this room. It'd fill this room. That's the data that we're now trying to capture and store so that we can use it. So how do we get long-term savings? As I just said, tons of data. Keep it all. Then let your analytics go to work for you. That's when you can start seeing the long-term savings, and then you can start really getting into the more fun stuff of AI and ML. But it starts with creating data. So if one of you takeaways from me, for two of them, one is get some talent and start developing. Number two, get your data and start storing it. You're going, you're going to need that. And we also realize in our industry, everybody's running real fast to get to a connected and a good consumer experience. So it's not a choice. Do we do it? We have to do it. We call, we, we, the analogy for us is lean 25 years ago. You really didn't know how it was going to save you all the money, but you just kind of felt like it was the right thing to be doing. So everybody got into it head over heels, and that's kind of the way the digital transformation is as well. And there are pitfalls. Uh, there is always somebody posturing that read the first uh, paragraph uh, in an article, and they read the last paragraph, and they're very smooth about the way they polish and present things. So. You always got the types that think they really got the tiger by the tail, and they try to position themselves as experts in the field, and two or three detailed questions, pulling the onion back, and you realize you're not dealing with so much of an expert. Uh, but the point is, you have these issues that you have to deal with. And also from a politics standpoint, everybody in our, in our corporation is bought into digitization. It's not a question, it's from the top down. What gets into play as you start going down is do I spend my time, talent, and treasure on marketing or do I spend it in supply chain or should I spend it on an MES? So then the politics start playing. As a digital leader, how do I overcome these things? And I think this is where a lot of people have to get to. Stay focused on what it is you're trying to get accomplished from a digital standpoint. Let all these things happen around you. Let it happen. Be patient. All those things work themselves out in due time. If you've got the right principle that you're working by to make these things effortless for the people you work with, for the people that you sell to, and the people that put these things in their homes, and make it simple. If you do those things, it's a winning combination, so let the noise remain noise. And that's trying to get you ready for lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rusty. I think that was a great kickoff to the session here. And, and although Rusty isn't, isn't necessarily in, in the automotive industry here with all of you, I think, as he rightly pointed out, I mean, there's so many issues there that are connect right across the way, uh, which I think would be very important as well for any, any 
automotive manufacturer or logistics provider who's looking to serve uh, either industry, and whether that's the focus on the customer, which I think you know, really does have to be the starting point for many of this, obviously the importance of the data and what you do with that data, and, uh, you know, and, and connecting, uh, connect, and the talent, obviously, I think that was a, such, a key, such a key point. Um, it's interesting that maybe you know, Electrolux needs to recruit more people who really want to talk to the dishwasher than, than maybe they would have done 15 years ago when it didn't necessarily talk back. I mean, we're all getting more isolated in our connected world, so I'm just glad to have someone to talk to now and again, actually. So, <laughs> so thanks again, Rusty, and we'll come back more on the Q&A. I'd now like to invite Mel Kirk from Ryder. Well, good morning. So Scott, uh, Scott introduced himself, and uh, he said he had the very best <laughs> job in the company and in the industry, and I, I happen to agree. I did a straw poll at a uh, team event or a company event in Dallas, Texas. There was about 300 employees there. And uh, I opened my presentation, and I said, raise your hand if you think I have the best job in the company. And I stared, and I stared. People didn't, some people didn't want to make eye contact. One person reluctantly finally raises his hand, and I think it was out of uh, sympathy. And the, the reason why nobody raised their hand is not because they don't think the CIO role is sexy anymore or any of that kind of stuff. It's the challenge of what we're into right now with the pace, and cha the pace of change in technology. And every time, every time, something happens, whether it's your laptop, your, your WMS system, your transportation management system, guess who gets blamed? This guy. <laughs> well, it is a great job and I, I am enjoying it. Um, today what I wanna talk to you about is about technology. Even though I'm, not, I'm in the CIO role, I'm an engineer by training, I'm gonna take a spin to pick up something that Rusty talked about as the central tenet of my presentation. First, a little bit about Ryder, uh, and it's not a paid political advertisement, but it's, 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 it's part of the story. Jim Ryder, in 1933, um, was working on a construction site in, in, in South Florida, in Miami. And uh, he was, he was, um, he was uh, part of the team that was taking bricks from a delivery truck and uh, uh, helping to build one of the buildings in, in uh, South Florida. Days after days after days of picking up and, and uh, uh, being a part of the building crew, he noticed that the, the person that had the easiest time in all of this was the person delivering the, the bricks. So he said, I wanna be like that guy. So he went out and he bought a truck, and uh, now 2017, uh, this is the company that uh, Jim Ryder uh, is responsible for, for, uh, for creating. And so we're a full, full spectrum uh, supply chain company, logistics, fleet management uh, across the board. So we, we plan a lot of areas that are being affected by the disruption that we're, we're talking about today. So Scott, Perry, and I, and uh, the whole of our leadership team took a visit out to Silicon Valley last uh, August, I think it was. And uh, it was kind of a sobering idea, concept, right? We went in, we wanted to open our minds to all of this potential disruption. We wanted to see what people were thinking about the transportation and supply chain industries. And meeting after meeting that we, we had with uh, different types of companies, startup companies in the area, one of the things that was consistent, or a couple of things that were consistent about the presentations were that I don't know that we met anybody that was older than, you know, 21, you know? And everybody in our, on our side was well over 21. <laughs> the other thing was none of them, none of them, had any reverence to this whole thing called logistics and supply chain or anything, right? To Scott's point, technology, disruption, opportunity, and for some, money, right? So 
we don't care about all of the, this journey that we've been on for collectively for the last you know, 40, 50 years, but it's an opportunity. And that's what we walked away with, uh, that the disruption to our industry is coming through the economy of now, right? I was at General Mills in the, in the days when Walmart stepped onto the scene as the big elephant in the room. And I remember we were doing um, General Mills making Cheerios at the time. And I remember we had, a, um, we had the small individual uh, box of Cheerios that we would get in the multi-packs. You guys remember that? Okay, the little multi-packs. And then we had, uh, I think, a 16 to 18 ounce. And then we had what we thought was a family ounce, which was about 40, um, 24 to 26 ounces of Cheerios. Now, who could eat more than that? Walmart comes along and they said, we want bigger. Mm -hmm. They said, we want a 36 ounce box of Cheerios. And we were like, really? really? And that was the disruption at the time, was that they were <laughs> changing the innate um, uh, configuration of the product, right? That was the disruption at the time. But one thing about that, that disruption is it created havoc at the manufacturing site, right? We had to go find a bigger box. Then as we uh, engaged the supply chain, we had to cube it out differently in the, in the, uh, in the uh, trailers, right? But we ultimately delivered it to a SAMS or to a, uh, a central distribution site. Amazon and you are fundamentally disrupting it in a different way. And that you're not asking us necessarily, or General Mills for necessarily for a 36 ounce box of Cheerios. You're now going online and saying, I'll take your little mini pack of Cheerios, but I want a pair of shoes to go with it. And matter of fact, I want to know every hour where that package is. Oh, is it there yet? Is it there yet? Is it there yet? So you guys are party to this disruption because you keep asking for stuff shoes to your driveway. Why do you need shoes in your driveway? Why do you need it? But you're a part of the disruption, right? This economy of now of wanting things individually yours, deliver it all the way to your home. That's disruption of the whole supply chain. Add to that the amount of visibility that you're asking for, that gives guys like me a headache and a, and a, and a, uh, a nightmare at the same time. So the economy of now is a big disruption. Industry regulations, talent shortage, and technological investments. Those are all real, meaningful things that are pressing on us at a, at a pretty significant pace. And, and the, the group ahead of us, uh, or the presentation ahead of us, documented all of the technological changes right, that are out there, from uh, autonomous driving to electrification and so forth. So this, this is real. I mean, we got asset sharing with, with Uber. Um, you know, who, who would have thought years ago you would have been okay with, you know, standing on a corner waiting for, uh, waiting for a, a summoned car to come pick you up, not knowing who was driving and whether or not they were certified in any way. But we do that now, right? Um, you know, and on, on down the line in terms of the technological changes that are, that are happening in front of us. But I would contend, like Rusty did, that I take this as a given. The technological change as a given. The more we dig into it, and when I harken back to the discussion that we had in Silicon Valley, it does come back to a talent discussion. So I'm an industrial engineer by education, and this page somewhat uh, articulates what you study when you're an industrial engineer, people, process, and technology. The merging of those three things to create an efficient uh, and effective system is what you're, what you're striving for. And the piece of the puzzle that I think all of us are continuing to leave behind or to discount is the people part. Here's the example. Rusty just told you to amass every single terabyte of data you possibly can. You may not know how you're gonna use it today but you probably are gonna use it in some, some future algorithm or analysis. 
Who's writing that for you? Who's helping you build those algorithms to think about the analysis, the combining of structured and unstructured data? Who's doing that for you? Are they in your organization today? So I showed the picture of Jim Ryder starting a company uh, in 1933 and the progression of, of where we are today. One of the heritages of, uh, of Ryder is that if you can walk around our organization, doesn't matter if you're in the Miami headquarters or whether you're in Dallas or it's one of our sites, you are going to meet someone that has been at Ryder for 25, 30, 40 years. That's who we are. We have pride in that. We celebrate that. But to Rusty's point, the skill sets that you need going forward are different from the skill sets you've inherently developed over the years. I spent time uh, about a month ago with the, um, the uh, Association of Engineering Deans. So all the deans that run engineering schools across the US and across the globe, they met in South Florida. We were on a panel, we were, you had me on a panel where I was talking about uh, disruption. And the central point, central point that I kept making to them was, you've got to address your curriculum in a way to adjust to the new realities of supply chain logistics. The person that you were graduating two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, was somebody that you were, you were coaching to understand the periphery of delivering uh, or working, working through a, a, uh, a delivery system, probably more on managing the people and integrating the people with the tools, right? But now, all because of you and your desire to have your shoes on your front door, on your front porch. Every day is an optimization challenge. How do I optimize the amalgamated requests from all of us to all of these disparate locations across the, across the globe into an optimized network so that Rusty has assurance that the product is gonna get to where it's intended to go. Do you have those people in your organization today that are skilled? They, they have, they have a, 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 an almost a, a native understanding of the applications that you're using, plus the mission that you're trying to drive. They have the ability to build hypotheses, right? To think a little bit differently about how do I get these packages this product, this car, this inbound to a more diverse location, set of locations. We got to retool. That's a big part of this whole journey with technology. It's probably one of the least discussed pieces, and I think it's a critical part of the journey that, uh, that all of us are on. Scott talked about you know, he has, when he, when he mentioned his job, he said he is the chief technology officer and procurement, chief procurement officer for Ryder. Scott had a full-time job as a procurement officer for Ryder. Had a full-time job. But what we did with Scott was we said, you were, your, your role is like this, now we're gonna shift it this way and have you engage technology in a different way. I was fat, dumb, and happy, still a little fat, but I was fat, dumb, and happy on the maintenance side of our organization, you know, trying to figure out how to improve the performance of vehicles, um, how to improve our, our, uh, our uh, fleet management uh, uh, network. And they came to me and said, how about, how about you think about being the CIO? The CIO, what? The CIO. And again, it was, it, was an intentional, it was an intentional shift to make both of us, in, the, in these two examples, comfortably uncomfortable with our new reality, to force us to think about the problems that we're trying to solve as a company 
Think about the problems that we are trying to solve as departments and organizations just a bit differently than we have for the last 40 years. And again, after our visit to Silicon Valley, we think that that is a very appropriate thing. So I think you got to think about your hiring practices. I, gotta, I think you got to think about your engagement with the colleges and universities that provide you talent. And I think, about, I think you have to think about how you leverage and reposition talent in your organization. Mission one to survive in this environment is that if you've got 300 people in your organization, 500 people in your organization, 33,000 people in your company, you need all hands in on innovation. There's not a singular person that's gonna solve this Rubik's Cube. You need all hands on and they can't be intimidated by the technology because they're not educated, because they, they, uh, they come from a different sphere. You've gotta invite them into the discussion in a different way and um, inspire them, encourage them, embolden them to take swings and create differently than we have for the last 40 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, I think he's, he's, he's maybe ranking up there for the best job in Ryder now. I think we should, maybe we should use our red and yellow cards to, to vote that, actually. <laughs> um, I like the, the idea, too, of the Ryder guys going to Silicon Valley with all these kids under 21. And I mean, at least you can get the beers in, right? So, no, but in all seriousness, I think you see the, the scope for, for potential and for collaboration. Whether, I mean, I think those 30, 40 year relationships and networks you build up will still matter. So they obviously need, you need to connect the programmer and the hacker into, in, into something that, that matters to your customers as well. And I think this emphasis on talent that we keep coming back to is mentioned by both of our speakers, and I know it's going to come up many times throughout this, uh, throughout this conference. It's something that uh, Louis and, and Automotive Logistics were trying to, to do more, to try to, to engage more with universities ourselves at the conferences, online in our, in our social media forums and things like that, so we can have a better dialogue for, for, what, for what's needed for the next generation, so to speak. But it certainly starts with all of you. It starts with this industry. And uh, it starts with the workers that you have as well, because uh, the workers down on the, whether it's the shop floor or in the warehouses, they've got a lot of knowledge and skills that um, an algorithm might not always exactly realize. So it's uh, something we all need to make sure we engage across organizations. So I thought it was a great uh, perspective, Mel. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to have a, a dual presentation, as I, as I mentioned and promised, um, with a kind of a case study, if you like, looking at, at uh, what's happening in Subaru over in Indiana. I'd like to first uh, bring up Michael Meyer, who's the president of Venture Global Solutions. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Louis and I, we always have these challenges. I think I met him back in 2005. And you know, going back to that, it was always, you know, we talked about the conference and how do we get better and what do we want to hear and how do we do it. And, and we'd go back and forth and, and bicker and I'd always say no one wants to change. It really wants to talk about the collaboration and talk about technology. And uh, it was almost like Louis met Daryl Bull 2015 and said, hey, call Mike Meyer. Um, I got the chance to meet Daryl. Um, he came from the Toyota side. He was in, in, in Lafayette, and we met probably 2015, mid-year, October of 2015. He says, Mike, I need a new TMS system. I need a new optimization system. We're going to implement lean separation centers. We're going to go through 100% uh, production increase. Uh, we're going to implement a new vehicle. Uh, my yard needs improvement. And we're going to do this in February 2016. So I met, I met my challenge, and uh, I've enjoyed the journey. Uh, today we talk about brains over brawn. Um, you still need the brawn to execute the brains of it. And what Daryl will talk through today, because he's going to spend the majority of it on this case study, is you need the innovation, you need the passion, um, you need the forward thinking. And Daryl gets that. He understands it. Uh, he knew where he wanted to go, and uh, he had a great partner with Venture and a lot of our people. And for the last two years at Venture, you know, Mel's talked. Rusty's talked about the people aspect of it, and I agree. I've dealt through those challenges over the last two years of finding the right people, people that get it and understand it, um, want to work hard and, and, and do that work. 
And uh, what you'll hear today is you're gonna hear the results of that. You're gonna hear about a new optimization system that went, went live. And I would say, anytime you go through a launch, was it flawlessly? It was, I would say, from our eyes as, as operations, who folks are in operations, it was a flawless launch. Um, we implemented a new TMS system. Uh, we implemented lean separation centers. Um, we've achieved significant reduction in miles and cost that improve uh, the, the, the flow in their, in their footprint of what they're doing today. Um, it's been a true partnership. You know, we've been in this automotive folks that have been in it for quite some time. We get the, the knack of, you know, the OEM or the tier beat and on the LSP provider. Um, I can tell you, I've never had a conversation where Daryl's called one of my people, right, and chewed them or said, hey, you know, this is wrong and it's your fault. It was always, hey, if there's an issue, how do we fix it together, right? How do we use our technology to do that? He'll walk you through that today. Um, when we did this, it wasn't a, a, a team of hundreds and thousands of people going in and doing it. Uh, my team from a leadership side, we had about six to seven project leaders on it. Daryl had maybe three to five. Um, and this was all achieved over a one-year period. So as we go through it today, you'll hear about a great product. You're going to hear a great story. Um, but again, back to the topic of brains over brawn, um, I pride myself and I push my team and tell them, hey, let's not be out work, let's not do that. Um, during this project, through one year, we were launching one of our, our separation centers, um, our lean centers, and through this lean transformation, I called Daryl and I said, Daryl, I haven't slept in two to three days. Right? And he said, Mike, please don't complain. He says, I haven't left the plant in a week. And that's a true story. So today, you're going to hear about someone that's a hard worker, understands it, gets it, um, was part of something of implementing an optimization system, a TMS system, a new cross stock management system, a new YMS system, and the results are there. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Daryl Bull. Thanks, Mike. Good morning. First off, I'd like to start with a little bit of history. So. We'll talk a little bit about SIA and where we've been and what we've been doing. We'll talk a little bit about why we had to make the change. Why did we want to do this? What was the perceived outcome? Why we, or our transformation timeline, why we partner with BGS, our overall supply chain alignment, our route planning from a pre and post viewpoint, our technology, the purpose of why we had to have this prior to our Impreza launch, the restructuring, the new yard management system, and our current and future Kaizans. So I'll tell you a little bit about SIA. This year we celebrate 30 years of manufacturing in North America. We sit on approximately 120, 820 acres. Sorry, I'm all broke up this morning. 820 acres and have 4.5 million square feet of workable space that has almost 17 miles of conveyor inside. We are capable of producing up to 450,000 vehicles per year on two separate production lines. Most recently we have just added our new, our second paint shop and an additional line capacity for assembly lines. We currently produce the Subaru Outback, the Subaru Legacy, the four-door and five-door Impreza, and with the newly coming next year is the Ascent, the Subaru Ascent. That's our eight-passenger eight vehicle. So to take you through the journey, what did we have to do? What were we looking for prior to the Impreza launch? Well, first off, if it turns, we needed production flexibility. We needed to be able to change our production methods at any given point in time, very quickly, very rapidly. We had to be agile. Next, we had our warehouse management. We had warehouse space that was given up to production and we had to determine how do we address that? What do we do with space? How do we reduce the required amount of space that we need? Increased volume, we went through volume increases dramatically. We had to address that. 
adapting to schedule changes. We had to be effective and efficient in our processes inside and externally. We had mixed production, model, multiple models on one single line. We also had bridge production, one model on two separate lines. And then we needed part separation. And I may need a little help here. There it goes. So what was it about all of these things? There we go. So first off, we knew that in our warehouse, we were going to convert it to assembly space. We're now going to produce cars and what we used to store parts in. So we had to reduce inventory. We knew from an inventory policy, we were going to go from one day of inventory, standard inventory, down to 4.5 hours. So we had to keep a repeatable flow. And from our parts ordering side, we wanted more of a throughput, right? very fast, very flexible. We wanted very high frequency, low volume inventory coming into our system. By doing this, we were able to increase our capacity, use, effectively use existing plant space, and streamline our processes. So from the baseline, sorry, back in 2015 is where we started. We weren't hooked up with Venture yet. We weren't prepared for the optimization. We were using spreadsheets and maps to set up our routing. We would bring anything in from one day to five days at a time, try to manage that through our system. We would have to control that inventory and hope that we got the next shipment in on time. In 2016, we started to optimize. One of the key optimization is we went from 850 a day to 1,000 a day. We had separation centers, we had technical solutions, we were also able to start that lean process flow for Subaru. How do I get that repeatable flow of parts into the system? In July of 16, we added a second production line. This was, we called our B line. We needed deliveries by specific docks into specific line groups at the specific volumes. We at that point went to 1,350 a day. The new product came on in October of 16. This is where we started the Impreza. We had over 50 new suppliers. We were building 1,600 in daily volume at this point and had over 1,000 new parts. We added a whole new uh, mountain of complexity, right? So we're now up to 8,500 parts for a plant that's running five different models on two different production lines. January of, I'm sorry, yeah, January of 17, we looked at it again and said it's time to reroute and re-optimize. We have to know where we're going and are we doing the right thing. We were able to do that and see an immediate cost of per unit. And then in April 17, just recently, we started the new YMS system. Our new yard system to be able to track and trace everything inside, outside the yard, knowing exactly what's on it, where it's at, and how to address it. Sorry, this thing just doesn't like me this morning. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so let's kind of look at that from a volume base. In 2015, we ran one production line at about 850 a day. Not so complex, pretty simple. In February 16, we started to optimize because now we have to prepare for the Impreza launch. We have to prepare for the complexity that's coming. <coughs> in July of 17, we had the A line and we started up production on our second production line. We now have the B line. Our production increased to 1,600. We have to be able to manage these parts in case one line or another goes down or some other issue happens and this all has to be addressed within the supply chain. From January of 17, we went ahead and re-optimized it to see where we were at and how we could get better, and we were able to do that. We reduced cost in 2017, and then for the future of 18, we're gonna increase again to level off at about 1,800 per day. 
once again adding more complexity with a new model, adding more difficulties from a production line, and adding more complexity to our whole supplier supply chain. So how did we get there? What are some of the things that we've got to look at? First off is total alignment. I believe Rusty talked about silos, right? Silos is one of the first things that had to come down. So even within the organization, whether it's your purchasing group, your engineering group, your materials management group, all silos had to be broke down. We're not all going to do the same thing, just in different viewpoints. So that was one of the first things that happened is we tore down the silos. They're all gone, right? We went to a one voice system where we're able to communicate internally to our external suppliers, 3PLs, et cetera, to make sure we're all talking the same voice. That was very important to us. Once we were able to do that, now we have to work with the supply chain. Supply chain's got to follow suit, so we've got to get alignment within the supply chain. We also have to get alignment within our uh, VGS group and also our 3PL. The ultimate goal of this was to maintain a repeatable flow of parts into the facilities and being able to address any abnormals that come up in the future. And we were able to do that very well. So now I want to take a step back real quick and just kind of go through the five different steps that we have taken. So first off, we started out, I said we used a spreadsheet and a map bringing parts in from either one day to five days in the same truck. Hopefully they show up the next day when they're supposed to. Very little tracking, very little use of digital information, right? That was the first thing. Once we started optimizing, now I could see it. Okay? Was not very flexible in the previous. Now I'm more flexible. Now I can see it, I can visualize it, I can touch it. I know what's coming to me. And we were able to do a lot of that very quickly. In February of 16, we started to optimize. The network optimization was part of it. The TMS system was another part. The lean logistics centers fell suit. Right? And we also had the dock specific deliveries. So why is all of this important and why does it have to all be in tune? I want to know when my parts leave a supply, supply base, where they go, do they get split out in the right production line, do they come to the right side of the building? Do they come to the right building at all? We have multiple shops all within a 20 mile radius. Some of them come to me, some of them go elsewhere. So we have to be able to manage that and see that. And that was very important when we started in 16. Then we moved on to the new technology, the route planning side. We've got the optimization, which was able to give us 32 what if scenarios when something you know, I, I think I need a, a logistics center in Nashville, but I actually need it in Spartanburg, right? We're able to look through that and see, are we doing the right thing, or should we be changing something up? And all 32 of those can be done within a week. This was a means for us to get to that very high frequency, very low volume flow that we talked about. There was a plan for every part across the entire network. So it wasn't just the supplier, to SIA, it was a supplier to the lean center, to our sequencing center, to SIA. It covers it all the way through the supply chain. Oops. And the next one was TMS. TMS was launched in 2016. It provided EDIs 214s, check calls every 15 minutes to validate where it was at, what was on it, what's going on. It strongly supported our inventory reduction. So how many people has reduced inventory by over a day in their facility? Anybody? Okay. We, we were able to do that and go from basically 1.25 days to four hours. And we were able to do that by being able to manage parts coming in. Without this, that would have never happened. We have to continue that repeatable flow. So that was very good. We also had daily adjustments and we had part visibility to the point of unload. Okay. 
So new lean logistics centers, you can call them consolidation points, you can call them distribution centers, you can call them cross docks, but realistically it's bringing those parts in, maximizing that trailer load or maximizing that cube, being able to distribute those where you need them. Right? Uh, I think it was, hey Mel, talked about Amazon, right? We talked about Amazon, how do we get it directly to the door, right, your front foot step. Well, I've got the same issue. I've got to make sure that I can get it to where I need to go. I have to go to 10 miles down the road or I need to come to SIA. So it was very popular in making sure that happens. When we had this, we now have every trailer that comes to the specific dock exactly where it needs to be. And I don't have to transfer or waste money going from one extreme to another. To the west side of the building, to the east side of the building, 20 miles down the road, it all comes to exactly where it's needed. In July of 16, we increased by 35% production again. We're now at 1350. We implemented a new Portland cross dock. We had the double line production. And once again, we had that integrated network going on. So when the Impreza launch came upon, did we achieve everything we wanted to achieve? Well, first off, we did get production flexibility. We were able to flex production within a very quick one-week time frame. We could move around. We were able to manage our warehouse effectively and efficiently. We now knew that this is the space I have and I can maintain all of that space. We had increased volume. We were able to achieve that without adding more warehouse space. Bridge production, adaptable to schedule changes. We were effective and efficient within our internal delivery because of the way parts were flowing in. We had mixed production and bridge production that was successful. And we had part separation, all of which we achieved prior to the Impreza launch. So as I said, with the Impreza launch, it brought a lot of challenges, right? We had 50 new suppliers, 1,000 new parts. We went from 1,350 to 1,600 a day. But that was able to go off smoothly based off what we had prepared for in the, future, in the past to prepare for the future. The redesign of 17, so first off, we were able to reduce cost. We could reduce cost because we could reduce miles. We were able to get other savings because I'm not moving parts back and forth, right? And we also had transportation because we were better able to utilize our tractors and the overall mileage and cube of our trailers. There we go. And then in 17, finally, the yard management system. Our yard management system, you know, this digital yard is real time, right? It's data-driven, it's automated, it's integrated, and it's connected. I can pull up on my phone right now and tell you where my trailers are at. I can pull up on my phone and tell you what's in that trailer. I can pull up and tell you if it's in the dock or out of the dock, unloaded, not unloaded, who did it. Right? I can see all that right here. And I'm, I live in Indiana, so I'm a ways away, right? But I can see that right now. And that's very important. So we use software, one, to eliminate the islands of information. We talked about silos. Silos have to be broke, and so do islands of information. It's all got to come together as one. We also use it, automated technology to locate and track inventory. It helps get the entire view of the supply chain. And it also leverages sensor technology to avoid the waste of time, fuel, labor, et cetera. Part of the new yard management system is before we started in 15, we had 300 trailers we dealt with on a day, North American side. We had about 150 in, 150 out. We're now over 700 with our new production numbers. We needed to do better in the yard. We went from the manual system to the automated system. We can now see it at any point in time. The drones are used to give us reads anywhere we want to go. If I want to go 15 miles down the road and check out one of our separation lanes or separation centers, I can do that. Right? I can go through with a drone and see what's there. I can tell you what's in that dock. It's not even at my facility. 
I can tell you if a supplier has unloaded the correct truck or if they're loading the correct truck all through this technology. And most of all, it gives us the KPI data to improve. So now we can do better. Well, me and this thing just are not getting along today. Okay, some of the Kazan activity, yard operation valet. I want to keep drivers on the road. I don't want them in my yard. So those, our shunt drivers are out there. They're getting the trailers ready to go. A driver drops it off, picks it up, and he's back on the road where he should be. Yard operation 5S. Are we where we're supposed to be from a safety aspect? Are we where we're supposed to be from a productivity aspect? We were able to accomplish that. The return operation at the cross dock. You hear a lot about the lean centers. We're bringing parts in, separating them out, getting them to the right docks. But when they go back, do they need to go through a cross dock? We were able to eliminate that step. So I may bring them in through one and send them back directly to the supplier. We're able to do that. A couple other things is we've asked for help from the outside, right? We need to look at some of our operations and make sure that we've got the correct flow for trailer yard management as well as our return process. Do we have the correct flow for our return process? These are some of the studies that were done through Venture Global Solutions that were able to help us do a better job in these areas. There we go. And finally, Kaizen is never complete. So we continue to Kaizen in 17, the last quarter of 17, we're going to start a new system for returnables. We're also going to turn around time for our reroute planning, order process enhancements, and an in-plant systematic material and packaging flow. As we talked before, silos have to be broken. So once those silos are broken, you can get through a lot more. The future is going to take us a little bit farther, though. I want to talk about the results real quick. Maybe. From what we've done in 15 to where we're at now, we're able to reduce actual mileage per vehicle by 13%. We created a continuous and even delivery flow, that pipeline that I talked about. We reduced internal floor space by 35%. We have inbound visibility to routes and parts. Three-point check for early detection of problems. Elimination of waste through wasted moves at the docks. And once again, continuous improvement so we can see it and do it. But that's only the first step. The next step is what we've been talking about and what the past two speakers have been talking about is that digital world. We talk about the autonomous car. We talk about the other things that are coming up, right? Whether it's hydrogen fuel or whatever it is. We have to start into that digital world because we're going to have to start collecting data on parts. At what time did you make that part today? At what time did that get on the truck? What package was it in? Who put the part on the car, right? We talk about regulations. These are just some of the things that are coming up in the future. For Subaru, this is the start. Now we're going to move into the digital world of getting that data, getting where it should be, and getting the right people in to analyze that data and see what we need to do. So. Oh, thank you very much. It ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl. Thank you also, uh, also to Mike. Again, I think we, we really have a, quite a comprehensive view over, over a, a transformation, uh, no short of a word, for the Subaru's operation. And with real results, I mean, you can't really argue how concrete and how, how, how specific <clears throat> the improvements were. And I think kind of as key or as exciting as, as the technology, whether it's the TMS and software or it's the drones flying around, uh, as that cultural change that needed to happen as well, breaking down the management silos, getting people to work across and communicate and not work in the old way. Um, I, again, I think this is a thread that you're, you're picking up across, uh, across our presentations. And uh, so thank you again to, to both for, for sharing that with us. Um, our final speaker for the, for the morning before we maybe have a few questions and then go to lunch is Shankar Jayaraman from BXP Digital. Thank you. 
Good morning again. Uh, my name is Shankar. Uh, I'm with BXP Digital. Uh, we are a new unit within Brambles, and Brambles is the parent company of CHEP. So today, um, I'd like to share with you our vision of the future of supply chain and how connectivity and connected technology overall is going to help get us there. Uh, the speakers before me have touched on many of the topics that I will probably touch on, and I would like to present a, a view of how all of this can come together. First of all, when I, so I'm, I'm, I'm a technologist and an engineer by training. Um, this is my first job in a supply chain industry, and it was the most exciting opportunity that I ever saw in front of me at the time that I was considering it. And I believe I have the very best job, actually. So we are leading digital transformation uh, of, of, of Brambles and the supply chain industry, we believe. Also, when I got started, we started to talk. Uh, I, I stumbled on this concept. Oh, this is the button. Okay. We stumbled on this concept of, of, of a circular economy, which has gained a lot of attention uh, uh, in, in, in recent years. The circular economy is, and is uh, conceived as a, as, an, as a restorative and regenerative system that aims to maintain all products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times. This system is inherently feedback rich. It thrives on information. And the information, when shared among all entities, fundamentally defines both how value is created and how value is captured. So we're going to talk about the power of sharing. In the, in the, in the presentation earlier this morning, someone said that there are five connected devices per person today or there will be very soon. We are all incredibly well connected. We, we live in a world of, of hyper connectivity. What all of this connectivity is doing is helping us all generate data and share data at scale. Like Rusty said earlier, we must create data. In some, some cases, we are creating data just by way of the applications and services we use. And in some cases, we must consciously generate data because data is the asset. All of this data is also creating possibilities for us to fundamentally change how we live, work, and play. One of the changes that is happening, and, 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 and we see this, uh, is, is the transformation of physical businesses to more service-oriented businesses. The service business relies on virtualized assets more than it relies on, on, on physical assets. And we see this very clearly in the case of Airbnb and uh, Uber, for example. Amazon, of course, is on a relentless pursuit to convert everything that's physical to virtual and digital. And more importantly, what these firms are doing as part of delivering their services is controlling the value they create to their customers through their platforms. These platforms define what is delivered to the customer, how it is delivered to the customer, and when it is delivered to the customer. And these companies are monetizing every aspect of that. That's how they stay profitable, or trying to stay profitable. So do we want to transform the supply chain into a services business? Is this desirable? Is this feasible? And ultimately, is it viable? So let's imagine an open network. We talked earlier about breaking down silos. An open network where 
Every flow today converges only at the customer. Every flow is now interconnected with each other, continuously sharing information. What can this do for the supply chain? We can shift from resource ownership to more of resource orchestration. We can move from optimizing a single pipeline to enabling interaction across pipelines so that all stakeholders in the supply chain can together deliver the value to the end customer. And by doing so, we shift from individual firm value to creating value for the whole ecosystem. So how are we going to get there? We are going to need to build, invest and build a lot of shared platforms. There's plenty of technology out there that allows us to digitize the edge, connect them to clouds. There's a lot of cloud computing technology. And by investing in data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and by building a suite of applications that meet all use cases, we can connect people, process, and tools, as was said earlier, into one co on, onto one cohesive platform that is, at, is distributed and unified at the same time. What this platform allows us to do is to also disrupt our business models. We can go from monetizing ownership of assets to monetizing information. Go from optimizing a pipeline to managing shared resource allocation using a platform. Go from siloed value creation for just for a single firm to creating value for the whole ecosystem. Now, why does it matter that we create value for the whole ecosystem? By creating value, we are increasing visibility across the entire supply chain, and that being one of the value propositions. And this leads to reduced risk and, overall, and, and better productivity overall. Taking this a step further, what if the supply chain could just think for itself? What does that mean? And how could we use it? So imagine a customer wants to order a car. She pulls up her phone and an app on it, and she proceeds to configure the car, every last detail, exactly the way she wants it, and she also decides when she wants it and where she wants it. If this app were connected behind the scenes to the entire supply chain, and the back end is, is non-trivial, as was pointed out earlier, this is, this, is, this, is, this is, there's a lot of heavy lifting there. If this app were connected to the rest of the supply chain so that all parts suppliers, manufacturers, packaging providers, logistics providers, administrators of state, federal, and local regulations. The app could consult all of them in real time and provide, at a click of a button, a quote which is customized for this customer given her needs. If the customer purchases, the supply chain would then go to work and with every part of the supply chain talking seamlessly to each other. I'm not talking about just information that, um, that is delivered in real time, but also insights from, from, from all the activity that has occurred over time. So this system will, will take some time to build up. Real quickly though, in, the, in a future where we have autonomous cars and nobody is buying cars, this is still relevant we would have fleets of service operators that cater to specific needs and specific markets. Perhaps that 
car that takes you overnight to your destination so you can avoid a, a hotel stay, as was said in the morning. Each of them will have their own specifications. They would want to order their cars and acquire them as quickly as possible. And better yet, because the supply chain is always listening, it knows when a car or a unit number 345 is going to fail somewhere and plans to deliver a, a replacement ahead of time or just in time. So what does all of this mean as, as for, for, for supply chain and for all of us? With increased supply chain visibility through these platforms, in effect, we would have created supply chains as a service. Such a service is predictive so that it can reduce and optimize inventory. It's impressive what uh, the, the Subaru team was able to do with, with four hours of inventory. You could be proactive and optimize logistics so that we reduce carbon footprint. It could be intelligent and minimize administrative costs. And it can maximize reuse of all the assets, which is the core concept of the circular economy, thereby completely eliminating waste. And, and, and these savings and efficiency gains could be material value to all involved. So what are we doing about this at Brambles? We are firmly committed to this vision. Brambles created BXP Digital, which is the group that I am part of um, last year. We are about 40 engineers and data scientists that are actively looking at all aspects of what I talked about. We endeavor to deliver integrated digital solutions that increase the visibility of supply chains in the supply chain and are, are the solutions that are, are required at the intersection of people, process, and technology. Of course, all of this will be built on top of Bramble's existing network. Bramble's operates with over 550 million assets and uh, worldwide, and we have 850 service centers, and we have 14,000 employees supporting these operations. We have a think tank later on this afternoon where I would like to share some more of my thoughts and views on this, and I hope that you will join us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Again, another, another good perspective there, obviously, from someone here based in Silicon Valley. Um, and talking more about how uh, digital transformation can, can come into a very specific part of the supply chain, an interesting proposition there. Uh, as was mentioned, actually, after lunch, we, um, we're going to divide into kind of small groups here in this room with, uh, with, a, with a leader at each, at each subject, so you can get a chance to, 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 to talk a bit more intimately and explore some topics more. We'll have the clearly labeled when you come back in after lunch. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists, actually. I mean, this has, I thought, been a really interesting session. It's been a lot of, a lot of meat, a lot of ideas, um, maybe more questions than answers. That tends to be the nature of, uh, of these conferences. Uh, so thank you to all of them. Uh, I know we are running a little late on time, and I'm sure you're all getting hungry, but bear with us, because it's going to be worth it. Um, before we move to the drone, I would like to give you an opportunity to, to ask a question if you, if you have one, because uh, it's good to have this opportunity and to take advantage of it. So is anybody, anybody willing to, uh, to put a question to our panel? Right here, we'll have a, a brave face uh, right in the corner. There, this is Mike. Can you say your name and company? Thank you. Uh, Jim Bideluck with Capgemini. Um, to the Subaru team, you, you defined your launch as success, and you and I talked a little bit um, uh, earlier this, this morning. Um, success is great, but what was the largest challenge that your organization had to overcome in order to deem it a success? So, 
from a Subaru standpoint, success was when the culture was able to change for, for the whole organization. I mean, are there always issues? I think everyone sees issues every time. But once you have a culture that always goes on the same path and one voice, that's success. So. Hey, quick question from my side to, to Rusty, actually, because you started off by saying you'd come here to, to learn a bit about what's going on in the automotive world. You're thinking the same things, what are things you can maybe share and, and work on together. So after maybe hearing some of the other presentations, perhaps particularly the Subaru case study, uh, what would you take away so far? Is there any things you'd say, ah, I really recognize that, or that's totally different, that doesn't apply? Um, I just thought maybe that's the first opportunity to <laughs> make a little comparison across, uh, across supply chains there. Yeah, so I've spent 30 some odd years in supply chain. I've been doing this gig for four or five months now. So, but uh, just because of my experiences, uh, it just naturally rolled me into it. But when I was listening, I was really interested in yard management. We need to talk a little later about that. Uh, but the things that were touched on at Subaru are the things that I've worked with for many years. Uh, when we talk about a TMS, we've, we've been working on that for the last couple of years as well. So I see a lot of things that are consistent with what we're doing in other industry, but I also see uh, some learnings that I've uh, captured as well from watching this morning. And I've made some good connections here. So I'm a customer here, I'm a customer down here, so <laughs> it's been worthwhile for me. Okay, great. Thank you Thank for you. that. <laughs> Any other, um, you, you slipped in something behind, I think, uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> um, any other questions from, from the audience? Or, well, a question right there in the middle. The mic coming your way. It's uh, Arjen Bongard, uh, Automotive IT Magazine. Um, question for Mel, but maybe also for the rest of the panel. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, encountered mostly under 21s in Silicon Valley. And I would be curious to hear your opinion on what kind of role the over 21s, which are probably most of us, can play in the digitization uh, processes. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, as I was closing, I, you know, I was trying to make the point that everybody has a role. And uh, I, I actually saw, as we went out and we, we had that visit, I actually saw that we have an inherent advantage in that we have people in the organization that have customer relationships, right? They, they, uh, they um, have been building those relationships for any number of years. Uh, we have folks that uh, truly understand the mission of whether it's Electrolux or Subaru, what you're trying to get in terms of trying to deliver that, that fully integrated um, supply chain. And then you have folks that um, understand people, process, and technology, and that, that merging of, of those together. I think, I, think, uh, I think those three things, to me, stuck out as differentiated uh, elements for folks that are in the industry today. And I think the challenge for all of us is to figure out, is to figure out you know, how to engage the, the creativity, the, the innovation, the the fast um, on-ramp of technology with the folks that uh, have been living and breathing it uh, for a long time. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be through that merging that you're going to get the best solutions. This might be yeah, I, I would also add, you know, I, I keep it simple. Uh, develop your digital eyes, and how do you do that? Uh, it's not a matter of being technology savvy or not. It's really about trying to develop an understanding of what technology can do for you. So in my leader standard work, every day when I look at it, I try to send out one to two articles uh, every day or every week, depends on how many I get that I feel worthwhile to move on. But I, I, probably, I probably send five to eight articles to different people in the organization, some up, some down, some sideways uh, from me, so that I can help develop their digital eyes because people still are living in an industry 3.0 world. They're looking at things predominantly the way they have in the past. And you've got to develop a vision for the future. And that's really what we're trying to get accomplished. You know, I take the, the Subaru example, right? It's the, and you know, you take the, the Walmart example, where where you went from a from a case to a from a cube to a bigger cube, uh, but moving along the full the full um, the normal supply chain, and then you go to the Amazon case where you've got 
um, individualized orders that has gone through some hy hybrid version of the supply chain. And the example here was integrating all of the pieces of the supply chain together. And one of the things that we've, the, the way that we're thinking about uh, logistics and supply chain is from an order management standpoint. And that, that came through loud and clear in that example with Subaru, is that before each, you know, the warehouse management system had its own function and transportation management had its own siloed function. To be successful, you've got to think about that whole management of an order because the, the unit size is getting smaller and smaller just based on how we order. And so um, uh, I don't think you're just going to get there with algorithms. I think you're going to have to have some of this innate intelligence to drive that. Yeah, I would agree with the Subaru example and the case study we've done. It's, you know, from venture side, it's an interesting concept that we have in a partnership, right? We have our asset division where we run 400 plus trucks coming in. So every part that comes into that Subaru plant goes on a venture truck and you're dealing with driver and driver shortages. And that technology and our people in that units connect to our uh, TMS system, which is tied to our optimization system, which is now tied to our cross dock management system and now all tied to the yard. So we're bringing that all together. Uh, from a people aspect, obviously, you know, we're trying to take our leadership. We've built a team here with, you'll meet Dr. Mani, Mani Vaughn in here shortly. His knowledge and experience of bringing that in with our folks that are on the floor in our returnable container center at Subaru, and how does that apply to it? So a blend of people and tying it all together, um, as, as Daryl had pointed out, that happened in one year. So you need a mix of the people that get it, people, processes, procedures, and technology, but you also need that piece of it from a true operator aspect of how do I understand that? How do I how do I do it day in day out? Uh, if I may add, uh, first of all, I'm I'm over 21 and I'm in Silicon Valley, so uh, it's a good thing to, uh, to be uh, to be part of this transformation. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, what the rest of them have said here. I think we at Brambles too. Though BXB Digital is, 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 has been created uh, to be in Silicon Valley and it hopes to harness all of the talent there, uh, we fundamentally believe that anything that I spoke about uh, uh, cannot be achieved without the expertise of the company overall. And by this we mean all of the operating experience that we have, all of the people expertise. And even to generate some of the data that, that we think will be important to building these solutions, people are a key element to that, to build in the feedback loops to tell us where visibility is needed, how people behave uh, on a daily basis. And, and so we have seen experimentation uh, um, uh, with technology where people ignore the people aspect of it and, uh, and it's often the, the people elements that causes uh, technology to not succeed. Not because people are bad, it's just that the technology doesn't fit the people and the behaviors. And I think, uh, so I think there is a lot to be leveraged there, uh, experience and, uh, and in, in, in doing things. And so we are actively reaching out to our customers, Bramble's customers, through CHEP and our other brands uh, to, to, to be better engaged in this process. Okay, thank you. It's very encouraging to know that there's still, you know, good roles for people over 21 in this industry. So obviously when I get to that age, at least uh, there'll be some opportunities for me as well. So <laughs> I think um, we're running just about out of time before we, we move into the, the prize draw. But maybe just one last question from my side, um, maybe starting with, with Mel. When you're kind of, you know, we, talk, we get very excited about technology and, you know, whether it's Google Glass or the drones, as we're going to see, and it is all very cool and has a lot of potential. But when you're making decisions, are you confident that the organization has the right approach about what's, what's actually going to be beneficial versus what's just new? And if something, uh, you know, maybe doesn't have potential for today but could transform in two, three, four years at such a quick pace, um, it seems to me that's actually not such an easy decision to make yeah. in terms of an investment. I mean, maybe you could just share a little bit about the thinking that the company makes when making those decisions. Yeah, so uh, I've, uh, I've, I've talked and written about this a few times. There's a lot of technology. I mean, that's, that's evident from the discussion here and, and, and all of the research that you can, you can find. There, there's, you know, in any, any given day, you look at my inbox of all of the, all of the opportunities that are being presented. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty significant. And so what we've focused on as a company uh, to kind of anchor us 
is similar to uh, Darrow in, in the Sumeru example. You gotta think about the outcomes that you're trying to deliver in the short term. Um, short, medium term in terms of what, what is it that you're trying to accomplish for customers, the company, and your shareholders. Um, and let that kind of guide you. you. You could invest a lot. It, this, this whole idea about data, the abundance of data. You can invest a lot in capturing data, uh, organizing data, um, cataloging it in some ways, but you still have to go back to the, the core premise of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So I think that's one piece, right? Um, but then to, Darryl, uh, to, to Rusty's point, I think there's another part of what we're trying to engage, which is this more creative, innovative environment where you step into a different room, right? You step into a different room and you think about the universe in a, in a, in a tremendously different way, unbounded, and that is more of a speculative type of uh, evaluation of investments, where the, the first that I talked about is a bit more structured. And we, you know, if I was going to say, you know, how you would split it, it's it's disproportionate for for a for a public company. Uh, you know, a good 60, 70 percent is going to be in that structured environment, and we're going to try to find a way to to do that 30 percent. That's a that's a bit more speculative, uh, playing for the, the technology. But it is tough. Focus on the outcomes yeah. that you're trying to derive. Yeah, absolutely. It was actually your, your CEO at one of our conferences last year who mentioned how, you know, in venture, cap, venture capitalism in Silicon Valley, you know, they expect about 18 to 20 right. companies they invest in to fail, and it's probably not the sort of investments that the automotive industry and logistics industry can, can necessarily rely on, right. uh, or at least, uh, well, maybe with riders' margins, but probably not with anybody <laughs> else's. <no. laughs> Okay, well, I want to thank our panel for a great discussion. I think we went through a lot of stuff. There's a lot more to come on these uh, across the conference, but thank you to all of our panelists. We're now going to do, do the prize draw, and um, uh, Mike might refer to Dr. Mani, who I believe is going to come up and, and tell us uh, a little bit about the the drone that, that's going to be used, so we'll get a mic over here. Uh, as he's sort of making, um, presenting, like we have a, a microphone over this way, yeah. Um, the, if anyone hadn't put in their business card yet for the draw, it's over here as a last chance. Um, we'll, we'll try and collect them as, uh, in the next minute or two. Yeah, I do. Boy, I see a lot of technology here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mani Manivanan, and um, it's great to be here. I'm the Vice President for Business Development for Venture Global Solutions. Uh, we do a lot of great things, and uh, some of that you heard from our partner, uh, our customer, Subaru. And uh, what I'm going to do in this is actually, I just don't want to be too long here because I'm between you and the lunch. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is to give you some more color on the yard management system that uh, Daryl spoke about. So oftentimes what happens is uh, we spend a lot of time doing the transportation management system and make sure that our trucks arrive on time, our freight arrive, arrives on time at the assembly plant or at our facilities and we worry a lot about what's in our warehouses, and we use a warehouse management system. And guess what? Both cases you are dealing with what happens on the road and what happens inside the warehouse. But what about something that gets forgotten, which is your yard? Because all the trucks, all the material come to a central point if it is an assembly plant or if it's a distribution center and it stays there. And I've seen situations uh, where we sometimes shut down, the, uh, shut down the highway systems because we don't have enough space to park the trucks. So with that in mind, you know, Venture started working with Subaru and we built this uh, yard management system, in introduced a new kind of a technology and we said, um, you know, it has to have integration with our rest of the supply chain system, right? If you don't have 
all the links connected and there is one link that's broken and you're not going to see the end result like everybody is expecting. So the yard management system is getting a lot of, lot of popularity, a lot of uh, visibility from the decision makers. So when you say yard management systems, what we always think about is a clipboard. You send a bunch of logistics guys, go to the yard in the cold, in the rain, in the sun, that's good. And you, all you do is you count the number of trucks and where they are, how many made it, how many didn't make it. And you come back to your office, put it in your computer and everybody got the data on the yard. By the time you enter all the information, half the data is already old, half the data is stale, and so you don't have any real-time information. And you again send the logistics guys to go to the yard and start counting. So this is a vicious cycle that we all experience, and what happens is we keep adding more and more and more trucks, and we introduce more and more in trailers, and that's our life, right? And so what we did is essentially built a technology, built a capability for Subaru to manage thousands of trailers in their yard. So if you go to assembly plants, you have some central material receiving area where you store materials. And in Subaru's case, they have a very innovative concept. They have trailers act as a rolling stock. They maintain all their inventory at the yard, but the challenge is to know where they are. When you need them, you need to be able to go there and get the right trailer, get it to the right door at the right time. So that's just in time, right? Uh, so what we did, we integrated the concept of drone technology and combined that with a software that integrates with our WMS DMS and then we can see where everything is. Because we are getting more and more lazy in my mind because we want to see everything in our PDA device. But it's also beneficial because you have the information at your fingertips, which is always what you wanted. So with that, what I want to do is to show uh, a drone fly and then see exactly how the information in a real time, in an autonomous way, come to a central computer. We are just going to simulate that here in this conference. And we've got uh, a gentleman, Jeff Martinko. He's from Michigan. And he, he's here to fly the... Um, a drone, and he's not going to be inside the drone, he's going to be outside the drone, and he's going to be piloting it, and he's actually a certified pilot to fly the drones. So with that, Jeff, can you fly the uh, drone that we have? <laughs> and as you can see that uh, it's flying with our information, and it's starting to transmit the information to a central screen. Just imagine for a moment that you are in our yard with thousands of tra trailers occupying in multiple acres of land and instead of sending a person in a vehicle to go around and do the counting and trailers where they are and what we need to do with it and then take that data, enter that information into our system again and again and again all through the day, now the drone system essentially transmits that information in real time and we'll be able to see it and we'll be able to see it on a computer monitor and then make decisions accordingly. This helps us in a great way, starting from the time the truck arrives at the gate and all the way the time it leaves the gate. All right, we obviously having the flow of information. I think we decided to hover around that area just to make sure that, um, you know, we are still within the reach of our pilot. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Chris. Chris, we're good. 
Thank you so much, Jeff. So we are actually very pleased with our progress and we see a lot of other opportunities, other applications for the drone technology combined with um, uh, yard management software. Um, at this time, you know, one of the things I'd like to do is to uh, have to come over and if you have not already filled your uh, a uh, raffle ticket and put it into our container. We are getting ready to start the raffle. Okay, Angelica. Okay, we have three um, raffle prizes to give away. Okay, who's going to draw it? Okay, let's start with uh, the third place which is going to be an Apple TV. Someday we'll be giving away a drone, but uh, not today. Okay, it's Steven Stewart, Director of Sales from LEDEC. Congratulations. Okay, the second prize is an iPad. Bradley Hamilton from Ryder. Congratulations. And the first prize, it's a trip to Hawaii. I'm just kidding. Apple Watch. As you can see that uh, uh, the product, uh, you know, some, someday we will have an Apple ring. I ring, I would say. But uh, we still are not there. Or maybe we are already. We, who knows? Uh, that's Steven Ostrich from Germany. That's our program. Again, uh, thank you all so much, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak to you. Okay, that's it. Lunch. <laughs> I think we've had enough. Have a good one.